Uh, Professor Robert Smiley is an authority on competitive strategy, on economics, and on economic trends. He was my predecessor as dean of the Graduate School of Management. He served from 1989 to 2003. Uh, Bob is our director of wine industry programs. He's a noted wine uh, industry economist. He studies global and national trends. What a wonderful thing that is to go around the world studying wine and calling it, calling it work. <laughs> uh, I'm learning from him. <laughs> He conducts a, an annual survey of wine industry insiders uh, and CEOs, and he presents the findings uh, of his, uh, of his uh, research to, at industry symposiums. Uh, I went to it this year. Uh, people just hang on his words. Find out what's going on, because these CEOs tell Bob things they will, will tell no one else, so it's, it's really quite, quite wonderful. He also teaches um, our executive education program for wine industry professionals. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, Michael Mondavi. He is the founder and coach of Folio Wine Company. This is a company he started with his wife Isabel, his son Rob, and his daughter Dina in 2004. Folio is an importer, agency, and wine grower of quality wines from the world's premier and emerging wine region. It also provides sales, marketing, and public relations to wine brands from California, Italy, Spain, and Austria. Michael co-founded the Robert Mondavi Winery with his father, Robert Mondavi, in 1966. He started his career as vice president of production at age 23, and he was responsible for winemaking until 1974. From 69 to 78, Michael also served as vice president of sales. And in 1990, he was named managing director and CEO of the company. Michael was appointed president and CEO following the company's public offering in 1994 and was chairman from 2001 to 2004. He's also very active in wine industry affairs and he is uh, committed to a number of civic activities. He's a member of the California State Chamber of Commerce Board, is past chairman and CEO of the Wine Market Council, past president of the Napa Valley Vintners Association, past chairman of the Wine Institute, and past chairman of Wine Growers of California. And in 1998, Michael was named Industry Executive of the Year by the Market Watch leaders. This is a group of top industry executives. In 97, he received the Who's Who in Food and Wine Award by the James Beard Foundation. And in 1995, he was awarded the World of Food and Wine Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Michael Mondavi has had many uh, accolades and many accomplishments, and please, in, uh, please join me in welcoming Bob Smiley and Michael Mondavi to UC Davis. Thank you, Nicole, and, and I'd also like to welcome all of you. It's a unique opportunity to hear Mike talk about some of the past and future issues, and he and I go back a very long time. Um, and I'm, I, we serve together on a board of directors of a winery, and we have a lot of interesting experiences. So I'll, I'll <laughs> dump. I'm That's not a talk key about word. Words. Interesting. <laughs> I'm going to jump right into it um, and ask Michael about his 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 childhood. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? High school decision to where to go to college. Um, I grew up at the Charles Krug Winery, uh, just north of St. Helena in Napa County. And my playpen was the winery and the vineyards, essentially. From the time I was about four years old, the cellar master was essentially my babysitter. And so it was really kind of neat because we'd have friends over from school or whatever, and I had kind of a neat jungle gym. Um, <clears throat> I was one of those students that didn't focus very well, and so uh, I was... Uh, uh, fortunate to be able to go to a, uh, a school in Ojai called Ojai Valley School, uh, which really prepped me for high school because the school districts in St. Helena were weak and I was a weak student and fortunately my parents put weak school system, weak student together and said we need to do something. I then went to um, Bellarmine College Prep in San Jose, which was a Jesuit 
High school, unfortunately, boys only. Very boring. <laughs> and then went to Santa Clara University. We were chatting earlier, why didn't I go to Davis? And as a junior in high school, I had the luxury of having a luncheon at the Sutter Club in Sacramento with uh, Professor Maynard Amerine, who was head of the uh, Enology and Viticulture Department at that time, and my father. And the purpose, I was a junior in high school, the purpose of the luncheon was to find out what electives I should take as a senior in high school to better prepare me for Davis, because that's essentially all I wanted to do was get in the, in the wine business. About halfway through the luncheon, Professor Amering looks at me, this, he was very quiet, very soft-spoken, and he said, Michael, you're not coming to Davis. And I went, oh, sh I think he saw my transcript. <laughs> uh, but he then went on to explain, he said, the, your family business, the Charles Krug Winery, needs you to learn how to make a profit. At that time, they didn't have a business school at Davis. It was really more of the ag orientation. And so he said, I think you should go to Santa Clara University. I know the dean of the business school there, Dean Dirksen, and he's very, very good. And I will give him a call, and you should go meet him and uh, learn how to make a profit. If you can make a profit, then you have the luxury of making great wine. And almost every morning when I wake up, I thank Professor Amering for that advice because there are unfortunately a lot of winemakers who make very good wine, who don't understand cash flow and don't stay in business. Um, so that was a, a very fortunate thing that Maynard Amerine and Davis did to assist me. So you're off at Santa Clara. Uh, your classmates include a gentleman named Sebastiani, another one named Francia, yeah. who started his company and named it after the m motto of Santa Clara, Santa the Broncos. Broncos. This yeah. is Tubac Czech, Bronco wine. Um, <laughs> during that time while you're away, and then shortly after you get back, you decide with your father to start a little winery. Um, well, almost. Almost. The reason we decided to start a little winery, I was supposed to finish college and then go and work at other wineries in Italy, Spain, uh, et cetera, for a couple of years. Then I was going to uh, come back, work domestically at the Charles Krug Winery for a year or so, and then go to graduate school, and then after about seven or eight years, be ready to, quote, come back to the family business. My father had the bad taste to uh, essentially uh, about this time of the year, a little, about two weeks before Thanksgiving, uh, get into a fist fight with my uncle. I wasn't going to bring that up, but you brought it up. <laughs> Thank God it happened. Um, and uh, long story short, a couple of weeks Later, my grandmother called a board of directors meeting for the family and had the then mayor, Joseph Aliotto, who was their family counsel as well, fire my father and inform me that there was no room at the house and there was no job for Michael when he finished college. Now, I had just gotten engaged. I was in my senior year. And because of the family's winery, I was going to have a job in Europe. Well, the job went away. My father's job went away. What the hell are we going to do? And uh, I remember coming home on every weekend at the end of after Thanksgiving through Christmas to work with my father on a fold-up card table um, in the garage, planning how can we start a little winery to produce maybe 25,000 cases and ultimately grow to 50,000 cases. But the main premise was the wines have to compete with the best wine in the world. And we spent more time not worrying about how do we make it, not worrying about how we sell it, 
how can we afford the cash flow? Because when my father went to the bank and said, I want to start a little winery, he could not get a $50,000 loan. He had no collateral. The car was owned by the family business. The house he lived in was owned by the family business. The only collateral he had was three kids in their clothes. <laughs> and so fortunately, a couple of friends loaned the money and two grape growers uh, bought 25% of the company each. And uh, we had three employees, my father, myself, and one other in 1966. My father's experience and uh, passion and my passion and energy and we just said, let's go get them, baby. And uh, I got the biggest scolding of my career about six or eight months later, kind of the spring of 07, when I bought 10 cases of uh, oil, grease, and other materials because I had a 35% discount rather than buying one case because we couldn't afford that extra money. And that really berating, if you will, taught me a little bit about, hey, the economics of the savings here isn't the important thing. Saving the extra dollars might save the business. And so it, it's kind of reminiscent of today's economy. Of <laughs> cash flow seems to be a little more important sometimes than P&L. Late 70s, a couple interesting transactions occurred, one involving Woodbridge, mm -hmm. the other involving Opus One. Could you right. tell us a little bit about how those came about? Well, Woodbridge came about because um, 1970, well, I'll back up. We started the winery in 66, knowing that if we crushed grapes, put them into barrels, aged it, and waited two years before we could start selling it, we'd be broke before we opened. So we said, okay, 60, 70% of our volume is going to be wine, the commodity that we can crush in September, October, give samples to the other wineries in November, December, ship the wine January, get paid in February, and cover our inventory that's being aged until we can sell it to the consumer. And so we were supplying Palmason, Almaden, the Guild, and others with some of their best wines for blending. Uh, one of those wineries in 1973-74, we had a five-year contract with the Geyser Peak Winery in Sonoma. In 73, they were purchased by the Schlitz Brewery when Schlitz Brewery and Pillsbury and Coca-Cola of New York were all buying into the wine business. Schlitz <coughs> honored the contract in late 73, the contract was for 300,000 gallons of wine. For us, that was 60% you know, of what we were selling to bulk wine. It was a simple contract. It was rated over the cost of grapes. Grapes cost $500 a ton. You get X dollars a gallon. All we had to do was present the wines. If they met the winemaker's approval, boom, get paid in 30 days. I took the samples over, 74 harvest presented them. They were the best quality wines we'd ever delivered. The winemaker looked at me and said, these are wonderful. I've been instructed to reject them. I said, why? How can you do that? He said, we've been told from Milwaukee there's a surplus now. And what happened in 74, huge crop, the dollar and the franc went upside down, the inventories of French wines and distributors were enforced by the banks to liquidate them. So great French wines and mediocre French wines, prices went way down and California was awash in a sea of wine. We were borderline bankrupt because that was our biggest customer and we knew three to four months out, the bank's going to own the business. I said, you know, Dad, um, we're selling wine in bulk for $2 a gallon. It's Cabernet, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. The biggest wine, what do you think the largest wine being sold in America was in 1974? You mean 
Well, it was essentially, I'll be Chablis. more broad than that. It was Gallo, but it was half gallon jugs of Burgundy and Chablis, right. jugs with a handle. That was 65% of the total wine industry then. And I said, Dad, our wine is head and shoulders above any of that. Let's put it in a magnum bottle with a cork and not call it Burgundy. Let's call it Robert Mondavi Red, Robert Mondavi White, and sell it in magnums only for $2.95. And he said, well, OK, let's try it. And so I took the idea to a couple of distributors and a couple of retailers. The retailers and the, and the restaurants. The retailers liked it. The restaurant said, I don't want to have to pull a cork. I want to just open the half gallon jug and pour <laughs> the wine. So I said to the restaurant, OK, let's open your damn screw cap and pour it. And I pulled the cork on mine and I poured it. I said, let's sit here at the bar and drink the wine. And the guy drank, each of them, about half a glass of the jug and two glasses of what was called Robert Dovey Red or White. I said, charge 25 cents more a glass. You're going to sell two glasses, not one. Your par profit margin will be slightly less, but you're going to build the image. Went back. We said, how are we going to, because this was just samples. This was brainstorming. How are we going to label it? We took the foil capsule that had a grape leaf and an RM, and I cut that off the top of the foil and took the arch and tower of Robert Mondavi, threw that away, and put the grape leaf with the RM on the front. So we'd have a different logo, not to confuse the premium consumer. And the first year, we sold 125,000 cases of that in 1975. Uh, then went to 350, and within like three and a half years, it was a million cases. And when I left the company in uh, 03, it was nine and a half million cases of wine, the largest single brand in America. Um, it was good. It was simple wine that tasted good at reasonable prices. And I got to do that because of my grandmother. She told me when I proudly went to her in 1971 and said, Nona, taste this Cabernet I just made. It's spectacular. She looked at me and she said, make wine that tastes good. I said, what do you mean? She said, make wine that tastes good. I said, what do you mean? Expecting her to say, well, Cabernet should have this body and the oak and the, and she said, it's simple. Serve it to your family and friends at a meal. If they drink a second or third glass, that tastes good. If they only drink one glass, go back to work. <laughs> and then with that, she says, but don't just make wine for those rich folks. Because these were you know, reserve wines. These were very important wines, $4.50 a 750 milliliter bottle. And she said, make wine that tastes good that people can afford every day. And when we had this dilemma of, oh shit, we're going to go bankrupt, and we have a lot of wine, my grandmother's words came back. And it was that that stimulated the creativity. The, uh, and, and the Opus One experience that mm. came about because of your father's friendship with the Baron? Yeah, my father and the Baron. I don't know what the camera is here. Um, <laughs> Baron Philippe de Rothschild was uh, a spectacular artist in many ways. He drove Ducati race cars. He was the, in the French Olympic sailing team. He was a delicate, essentially. He was uh, translated many great uh, literary works uh, into three or four different languages. And he decided when he grew up and his family had Chateau Mouton Rothschild, a second growth, that it needed to be no a first and worked to move it up to the top stature. He was very upset with the Appalachian Controle system in Bordeaux that was so staid that it didn't allow research. It didn't allow new ideas, new presses, new ways of pruning new winemaking techniques. And he said, our winemakers and our people are going to be bored, and they're going to be stagnant. The world will go beyond us. And my father and the Baron had met a number of times, and they were talking about this. And my father said, well, let's do something in California. Let's do a wine together in Napa. And the Baron said, if we do it, it has to be 50-50. 
And if we do it, you make the wines, but I need my team there to learn the new innovative things that you're doing in California, which had a lot to do right here with Davis. And so the meetings were set up, and my sister and father went to meet with the Baron for three days at his estate in Bordeaux. And the first day they tour vineyards, they have a nice dinner. Second day they tour vineyards and wines and taste other wines from the cellar and the barrels, they have a nice dinner. Third day they do the same thing and they're having the final dinner. They're going to leave at 11 o'clock the next morning. My sister's going, Dad, we've been here two and a half days. We haven't talked any business. We're supposed to be here for business. This is, what are we doing? My father said, relax. That night at dinner, the Baron said, Bob, I think we should meet at 10 o'clock to talk about the project. Uh, please come to my chambers <laughs> at 10 o'clock. So at 10 o'clock, my sister, my father, go into the cha Baron's chambers. It's his bedroom. It's, a, in his estate. it's about the size of this room. One corner, there's a life-size leather horse. His two... <laughs> His two yellow labs are on the bed with him. He has two like bed trays for eating, but there are papers all over. He's in his velvet smoking jacket. <laughs> and he said, before luncheon, I don't go to the office. This is my office. And my father, my sister's about going nuts. The Baron said, you know, it really should be 50-50. We need Cabernet Sauvignon. We can't call it Bordeaux. We can't call it, it shouldn't be Napa. It shouldn't be this. And, it's, uh, and so my father said, well, why don't we have it the, the fruit and liveliness of California with the structure and backbone of Bordeaux? They said yes. That was the end. My father comes back, tells me about the meeting. I call my sister and say, what the hell took place? <laughs> she repeats it. And then my father looks at me and says, okay, get to work with their general manager and their attorneys and put the deal together. <laughs> it took 18 months and 73 pages to make the 50-50 agreement. And it started out at um, uh, 2,500 cases to grow to 5,000. And Opus One, um, at least, three years ago was producing 35,000 cases of wine sold at $140 a bottle to the consumers. So, um, and, but the key is, again, my grandmother comes back in, it's got to taste good. And that was the cool, whole thing, is don't make a Bordeaux, don't copy Bordeaux, don't make a typical California, make hopefully the first international wine. Yeah. Um, a lot of things have changed in other industries, internet, electronics, microbiology. The wine industry doesn't seem to have changed much in the last 40 years. Have there been big changes we haven't seen? Um, I don't think we can keep up with the change in technology or electronics uh, because we go back, you know, wine is theoretically the second oldest profession. <laughs> um, but um, the, uh, give you some, some interesting numbers. In 1966, when we started Robert Mondavi, 82% of all wines sold in America were port, sherry, or muscatel. 18% was either champagne or table wine. And of that, 98% was jug wine. And so under 1 and 2% of the total wines sold in America were what would be considered good quality table wine, not luxury but just good quality table wine. And so in the 40 years, it's gone to where you can't find port, sherry, or muscatel unless it's a good port from Portugal or unless you're in Skid Row and there's still some <laughs> night train or MD 2020 or something. <laughs> but uh, that's changed dramatically. Uh, the image of wine, I think, has changed as dramatically when I was in high school and college, and people would find that I was from Napa Valley and in the wine business, they thought Napa, they, they heard Apple Valley, not <laughs> Napa Valley. And in the wine business, and it's, oh, you make stuff for Skid Row. And needless to say, in the last few years, um, wine has become the paper tiger. 
people involved in the wine business, because of the image of wine, you could add three zeros to what their sales are, and that's what people perceive it to be. But we're a tiny cottage industry in the real world. The uh, family businesses you've been involved in virtually your entire career, although you had a brief corporate experience mm -hmm. at, at Robert Mondavi. How are they different than other businesses? Do you think they, are, they have a place in, in the world going forward, or are they a, a thing of the past? I think family businesses are the en engine that are more creative, and they build the brands, they build the new opportunities, at least in an agricultural-based wine industry. Um, and then as they're built and sold, or go public, or whatever, uh, for every one of those that are sold or taken over in uh, consolidation, there are probably a dozen new ones that start. Um, I think part of it has to do with estate taxes, but I think the main part has to do with uh, family transition and the inability to either train or to have children who are interested in the business. Uh, one of the problems in the wine business is people are so passionate about it that they spend 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week in it, essentially ignoring their family or kids. Uh, I was a similar victim of that. Thank God I had a, or have a very patient wife and children who um, finally decided, hey, the only time we can see him is in business, so let's work with him. But, um, we, in the wine business, um, more of the creative ideas and the brands are built by families. Um, the big companies, and wearing my corporate hat, we could not afford the five to seven years it would take to build a brand because the return on assets for that investment were unattractive to the financial community. And it's much easier for a company to go out and buy a winery that had done that investment, pay a premium, put it into your portfolio, and then put it into your huge marketing and sales network and pop the volume, even if you, unfortunately, bastardize the style or quality. Um, most of the corporate world don't believe the consumer will recognize that, and I think they're dead wrong there. If you look at the name wineries in the Napa Valley, there's a whole series that were started in the 70s by people that are icons now. Your mm -hmm. father among them, Dan Duckhorn at Duckhorn, Jack Cakebread at Cakebread, uh, Joe Phelps at Phelps. They and a lot of other wineries have transition questions. And, and, and how do you prepare a family business, especially in the wine industry, to have a, a, a useful and fruitful transition to the next generation? I'm a great person to ask that question because my father, my grandfather <clears throat> couldn't get it to my father and uncle's generation without having to start a new company and my brother and sister and I couldn't get it to the next generation without it. We were unable to go to really a good transition at all. I had the luxury of importing wines from a number of families throughout Europe the Fresco Baldi family, 31 generations in the wine business in Tuscany uh, over 700 years. And I asked Vittorio Fresco Baldi when Robert Mondavi Corporation was in the process of being sold, I jumped on a plane and said, Vittorio, I need help here. Uh, what's, you know, how do I set things up with my kids for the future? And uh, he said, well, it's very complex. And to make a long story short, he said, it's also very simple. If you don't teach the younger generation as children and young adults conflict resolution among their own generation while you're still alive, it will be impossible for them to have conflict resolution among themselves once you're gone. And he said at Fresco Baldi, what we would do, and my father did this and my grandfather before him, would never decide between two of the siblings, but would say, did you think about this? Did you think about that? Go back and work this out yourselves. Come to me with your solution, not your problem. 
And um, by doing that, they have been able to, and the Antonori family is the same, they're only 600 years old, they're the youngsters in Tuscany. Uh, but I think that it's that very difficult but very simple thing where you have to start it young as parents with children and then adolescents and then young adults and you can't stop the training process until you're dead. Let me turn to the role of outside advisors. You and I served together on the Delicato board owned by a family, the Indelicato mm -hmm. family. When do, you, when do you bring in, and you're now starting a company, which I'm about to get to. When, when do you bring in outside, it's outside advisors? What do you use them for? How do you know if you need outside advisors? Um, I'll back up just a moment. The, the best thing that happened to me growing up uh, as a young person in the winery, I said we had three employees when we started at Robert Mondavi. One of them was a fellow who had never worked before in his life, but had loaned us $50,000 <laughs> and said, I want a job. And so we paid him minimum wage and minimum interest. And uh, uh, he was a mentor to me as well as a handyman mechanic and just did all kinds of things. But he would say, easy now, think about this. Here's what we're doing, and he'd slow you down. I think in advisors, I think the first thing, particularly in family-type businesses, mentors, people you respect, whether they're, you respect them for their values or you respect them for their business expertise, mentors to young children and young adults, and then through your um, career, having a mentor, and they'll change as you go through your life cycle. I think is vitally important. In our little business folio that we just started four years ago, um, our <laughs> board, if you will, consists of my son, my daughter, uh, David Frankie, our general manager, and myself. And we're saying, look, we're so focused here on our vision and what we're doing. Um, our objective is in 2009 to bring in three outside uh, advisors because we don't want directors because of all the darned litigation now and so instead of a quote board of directors most private companies to protect the directors and get the great advice are going to board of advisors uh, but we want to get uh, three outside advisors um, and actually I don't want any of them involved in the vineyard and wine business because we have all that expertise we need all the other stuff if you're successful with a small family-owned business, you, you might go public. Could you talk about that decision? How do you make that decision? When is the right time? And maybe contrast it or say what you did right when you went public at Robert Mondavi? Or what we did wrong. Well, I was leaving you that option. <laughs> um, the, uh, the idea of going public, to me, before so Sorbanes-Oxley, was a viable alternative after Sorbanes-Oxley, uh, I don't believe is a viable alternative if you want to stay involved in the ownership or if your family wants to stay involved in the ownership. Uh, if you want to sell out, selling out by going public, as long as you have permission within six or nine or 12 months to essentially exit all of your stock uh, is, is to me a viable option. And the reason I say before and after Sorbanes-Oxley, before Sorbanes-Oxley at Robert and Davy, we had five outside directors, and they were very good. One was the retired chairman of Diageo, the largest spirits company in the world. He was based in London. We had to fly him in each time. The other was the vice chairman of IBM, who lived in Canada. Uh, we had really top, top people. Uh, an investment banker who very, very knowledgeable. Uh, one of the top people from the duty-free stores. So we had the retailing. Before Sorbanes-Oxley, they understood the strategic direction and the long-term requirement for a luxury wine company to have to make long-term decisions. We're going to add more vineyard, whether it's for Opus One or uh, a Napa Cabernet, 
it's 10 years till you get the first dollar from that vineyard from a retail sales standpoint. So there's negative cash flow, there's very bad return on assets, and you're asset heavy. Public companies don't like that. But before Sorbanes Oakley, you could explain it to them and say, if you are not interested in a five to ten year, I mean seven to ten year return, leave the meeting, don't even listen to my presentation. We don't want people who are here short term and are going to flip the stock. You could do that and the board would support you and you could make long term decisions. After Sorbanes Oxley, it was maximize value for your shareholder. And if there's less risk by selling the company today than growing it at 12% a year for seven years, sell it today. And that's a very abbreviated summary of my impression of Sorbanes Oxley, but the, the directors, our directors who were wonderful, very strong business people, were advised by their legal counsel that they had to focus on maximizing shareholder value within a very conservative period of time. And if by selling the business, that was the best answer, that is what they had to do. And after Sorbanes Oxley, the partnership, if you will, of the family and the outside directors shattered. And so it's a whole different world today. Uh, I would rather uh, go to the independent uh, mezzanine markets and have um, different financial partners knowing that in five or seven years they're going to want to sell their interest and they may sell it to another investor or you may buy part of it and sell it to another or you may decide let's sell the whole thing. But that would be healthier today in my mind than a, a family business going public and wanting to retain ownership. Working with partners, you're going to be more solid than the public market. Many of the students here and the alums as well are uh, thinking about starting their own business, either immediately or at some time shortly after they leave us. Uh, any advice for uh, that decision, how to structure it, how to think about it? Well, um, the answer will be yes, but also in the Q&A part, I want advice from you all. Um, first, I think you have to make sure that your values are clear. Uh, one little thing, I think I have it. No, not there. Oh, it's over here. Uh, we did it at Folio, and every one of our employees and almost all of our customers and suppliers have this little business card, Spanish one side, English on the other, and it's just Folio. Fine Wine Partners, our core values. In starting a new business, if you don't understand the vision and the values that you're going to have, you might be successful, but there will be more luck than, than, than real. So our values are very simple. People, culture, integrity, leadership, operational excellent, excellence, customer focus, and community, meaning give back to the community. Every employee, before they go to work for us, understand our values. Once they understand the values, the selection of the people, to me, is the most important aspect. So values, your vision, your people, and then understand the cash flow requirements. And set it up so that you can make long-term decisions because once you start making short-term financial decisions, you may have to start sacrificing quality, image, values, et cetera. And on a young company, you can't afford to do that. Your customers will give you maybe one break, but not multiple. So uh, if all of a sudden you are changing your vision or changing your values because of tight cash flow, um, that will be an Achilles heel to a, to a young company. And don't be too grand in your objectives the first few years. As I mentioned at Robert Mondavi, our first winery design was 25,000 cases, ultimately growing to 50. Well, the winery sold 11 or 12, 12 million cases when it was sold in 2004. So 
if we'd have started by saying we want to be a multi-million case operation, we'd have died early. When you set up Folio, you obviously had to decide what to do, what lines of business to be in, and, <laughs> and you had to decide how to structure the company. Well, it was really pretty easy because my wife, after my being at home for about a month, she said, you know, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> So it had to be you're, to take you're you out driving of the house. me crazy. Do something. Uh, no, seriously, uh, my son, daughter, wife, and I love the business. It's essentially uh, all I know, and um, I also had the great luxury of developing phenomenal, uh, not just relationships but friendships with people in the industry, and uh, particularly the Frescobaldi family in Tuscany. Um, and we at Robert Mondavi in the uh, 90s and uh, early 2000s were the importer of their wines, and they were one of the preeminent Italian wines sold in America. And uh, Vittorio Frescobaldi asked me, uh, when he knew that Robert Mondavi was going to be sold, if I would start an import company so that I could represent his wines. And that was really the cornerstone of folio. And then I said, you know, what is it that I've done? I had the luxury of, uh, for 40 years, essentially, being in the trenches in the wine business. And then for a couple months, I had the luxury of getting up to like 30, 40,000 feet and looking at the global industry. And I said, what's going to happen out there? And I said, first of all, consolidation is going to continue. And it'll probably accelerate, whether it's at the vineyard level, the winery level, the distributor level, the retailers, the restaurateurs, the hotel. It'll all consolidate. Is that good for us as a small family business, or is it bad for us? The answer is yes. <laughs> it just depends how you do it. If you're independent and small, but small enough to where you can sell everything direct or through the internet or your mailing list, and you don't ever want to grow beyond that, Super, no problem. But if you want to go b beyond maybe more than five or 10,000 cases a year, you have to also be interdependent, I believe, in today's, in the future world. And what I mean by that is, um, in the research, if you have a small vineyard owner and a winemaker, can you afford the best research for the vineyards, for viticulture or enology? When you're going to sell your wines, can you afford the best market research? The answer is no. It's too expensive. But if you have 20 or 30 families who are each independent with their own vision and values and their passion and their heritage, and you then put people together interdependently to where we represent not just their wine, we represent the family. And our responsibility is to communicate their heritage, their personality, their personal style to the consumers of their wines throughout America. And by spreading the cost of market research, public relations, sales, impact on the distributor. If I have $2 million of sales through a distributor in the state of California, they aren't going to answer my phone call. If I have $15 million of sales with that distributor, he'll call me back within seven minutes. And so you need, particularly as we go forward and consolidation is greater, if I want to sell in only the Class A uh, Safeways or only in certain location Costco's during October, November only for their little treasure hunt for like Domaine de la Romani Conti and stuff like that. Independent Michael with his 10,000 or 50,000 cases would get just swallowed up and killed. But by going in and representing a portfolio of family wines with integrity and heritage of those families behind them, we can compete not just equally with the big guys. We have a secret weapon, and it's called personal relationships and individuals, the family members meeting 
the key people, the key customers, the key consumers. Every brand that we represent from around the world, the family members come to the United States market and work the market for at least three weeks a year because it's people that buy wine from people. They don't just buy wines from a catalog or from the, the internet. The other is that the biggest mistake I made at Robert Mondavi, particularly when we were at Public, was not encouraging the employees to take a greater advantage of the stock purchase plan. The executives had stock options and this and that, but in public companies, the stock purchase plan, at the end of each quarter, we had it set up, they could buy stock at 25% lower than the low price. And if they would, and we educated them about that, I thought, we didn't. We talked to them, they didn't understand it. A few of them did. But if the employees, and there were 1,200 of them when the company was sold, had owned only 10% of the company, those employees would have gotten $130 million worth of value. And so I said, you know, I blew it there. I'm not going to do it again. So we started Folio, 12% of the company, day one, earmarked for the employees. And with the economic condition right now, uh, something that my son, daughter, and wife and I were talking about earlier in the week, is, you know, it's tight, the sales are going to be off, the restaurants are just really slow, the hotels, we're probably going to be 15 to 20 percent below our plan. We really can't afford to do the proper price increase or wage increases and or bonuses this year. Said, well, gee, we should, but, uh, well, we said, tell you what, why don't we give them more stock? We'll say, look, for all of us, it's not good go out and spend more money. We have to harbor our cash. But you're part of our extended family. We have 54 partners in our employees. And so we are going to be actually announcing next week to the employees that we're going to uh, give, in lieu of uh, increases this year, more stock. It's amazing what people do if they believe they're one of the owners of the company. Instead of 54 employees, we have 54 entrepreneurs. And they take full ownership of their job and what they're doing. And they come to you with creative ideas that would never happen if they were just an employee. It's absolutely magic. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is ask if there are any questions from the audience. We have several mics that will be produced and presented to you. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. And Mr. Sabra down front, but wait till she gets there. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Here comes the mic. You know, I'd like you to go to one of those wine auctions because you put your hand up there and just don't <laughs> move it. Um, my question to you, we, we talked about succession and transition. Uh, what are your plans and uh, how are you implementing those plans to transition the business to your, your offspring, you and your wife? Uh, one of the reasons my title is founder and coach is because, well, actually my daughter gave me the title, but uh, I told my, my son and daughter, she's 29 for the third time, <laughs> and he's 37, and I told them when we started the company that I wanted them to make the decisions, and in the Fresco Baldi philosophy, I said, any key decision that's made in the company, the three of us are going to discuss it, the two of you are going to get together, and then you're going to tell me what we're doing. And I hold the power of veto, but don't ever come to me and say, we can't decide, he wants this, she wants that. And so far, they've been beautiful on that. And so I said, other than selling the company, the two of you agree, if I'm not available for consultation, do it. And then just tell me later. And so I wanted to be the coach to guide them. And I want them to have the responsibility. But an interesting thing is that um, I felt that there was too much detail needed in managing the business from a day-to-day -day standpoint. And so I suggested to my son and daughter that we hire a managing director or general manager. 
and my son got his nose out of joint because he said, well, Dad, that's my job. And I said, Rob, I said, your job's more important than that. Your job is more strategic. Your job is communicating to our customers and making sure that our relationships with the 28 families that we're doing business with around the world is solid. And we need to hire a very good business manager to run the day-to-day. And so you and your sister and I are going to wear a hat of board of directors, and then I'm going to wear the hat of coach, and you and Dina are going to wear the hat of employee reporting to the general manager. And so we said, let's think about it for a while. And we thought about it and let them go. I said, take a month, come back, and tell me what's wrong with it and, uh, or what you like about it. And also, if you have any ideas on who it should be. And they came back, and I said, I want at least three people on the <coughs> list. And they came back about three weeks later and said, um, we have this one person, I said, you're supposed to give me two or three choices. And they said, we have one person. You said if the two of us want the same thing, you'll agree. And it's David Franke. And I said, oh, OK. And it happened to be a fellow that had worked with me at Robert Mondavi for 20 years. But the neat thing is they chose, essentially, their subordinate from a board standpoint and their boss from the day-to-day operation standpoint. And we work very hard on communicating, which hat am I wearing? And like with my kids, there are times I say, oh, I'm speaking to you as your father now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm speaking to you as the founder and coach. And it re- it's, it's unbelievable how helpful it is when you say those silly words. Because the, the worst thing on family business and on transition is, are you talking to me as dad or as mom or as business partner or as boss or what? And if you have that cleared up, it's much, much easier. Uh, my son would fight me on things if I would talk to him as his founder and coach. And I'd say, hey, Rob, I want to talk to you as your dad about some value issues. And he'd go, got it, got it. And so it's very helpful. Other questions? You know, come down here. We'll take one of them. card you, you pulled out with your values and your vision. From your standpoint as the founder and, and coach, how do you how do you get a sense of those things actually happening or not happening? Well, for example, one of those integrity is pretty simple. You know, if, if, if you think that you have some of your employees or partners and you don't have confidence that they have full integrity and you've got a basic problem there. Uh, but the simple one to, especially today when everybody's scrambling to work harder, smarter, more efficient, etc., uh, our value of community. Um, I was asked a couple times, uh, you know, can we spend less time in supporting some of these community events and just focus on selling more wine? My answer was no. I said we cannot sacrifice values. We may have to sacrifice profit for another two or three years because new companies don't hit the ground doing green green profit. We're, and we thought it would take three to four years of losses until we would break even. We're supposed to break even 2008. <laughs> funny, funny. We'll <laughs> probably break even 2010 or 2011. I'd rather break even in 2012 and not sacrifice values. And everybody in our organization knows it and we talk about it. We don't just put it in our pocket and ignore it. If you do that, then it's useless. Um, And again, the fact that they're all partners, they coach each other as well, or they encourage each other. And fortunately, we haven't had the situation where they come and say, hey, we got a partner we have to get rid of, because those are tough decisions, and you have to do it if, if it's needed. Question over here? Yes. Wait for the mic. There you go. No, it's your mic. 
So you have such great experience in the global wine industry, and you did mention consolidation as sort of a factor in today's um, global wine industry. But what do you see as the most exciting change that's going on right now and as far as the future of the industry? The millennial generation, of which I'm obsolete. Yeah, we're uh, in it. <laughs> um, but um, the millennial generation, the first time in the history of the research since it began in, uh, right after World War II, um, was it's the first time that women of the millennial generation are drinking more wine than men. And it's the first generation where men and women combined are drinking more wine than beer. Sorry, where are you? <laughs> a whole bunch of Coors people, most of the Coors here people. <laughs> and so to me, what's so exciting is, especially from when I grew up, and I'd go to a restaurant and order a, in Omaha, Nebraska, the best hotel, I went into their restaurant, which is a very nice restaurant, ordered a glass of red wine because they didn't have a, a wine list in 1968, they brought me a glass of port to have with my steak. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> but to me, the young people are no longer as intimidated about wine. They're trying wines. They are interested in um, experimenting with different food, beverage, style, <clears throat> and boy, that's the future. It's exciting. And Hopefully, it's going to help keep me at least mentally young. Question over here. Uh, let's take that one right next to you. I'm, I will go to the back of the room. Hi. Um, there's a lot of discussion today um, that deals with diversity and inclusion and how it um, impacts the bottom line. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how that fits into your business? Um, well, one of the reasons we have Spanish on one side and English on the other is to make sure, because our vineyard and winery, we have a lot of Hispanic workers. Uh, is, is this what you're referring to? Is the, yeah. Um, I see essentially all ethnic groups enjoying wine, and I'm not just saying wine as the category, I'm saying wine on a special occasion, but also wine on a more regular basis. Uh, what's uh, Exciting to me, um, the Mexican population drink a lot of beer, but they also are enjoying more and more wines. You go down to in uh, southern Texas, the amount of wines that are sold in San Antonio and other southern states that go across the border to people living in Mexico is astounding. Uh, in the African American communities, I did my first tasting with an African American group in 1969 or 1970 in, Sac in San Francisco. They were so enthused and developed such a loyal clientele, they kept coming to visit us on an annual basis. We had a ball. All you need to do is introduce, I don't care what ethnic background it is, I don't care if it's Asian or um, uh, European, uh, South American, give them the opportunity to taste wine and food. Not just, here, taste, but like tonight, we had wonderful appetizers. Did you notice how with the food and the wine, they both tasted better? But if you just sat there and were sucking down the wine, it kind of gets, oh, well, I've had enough, that's it. So I don't think, I think ethnicity has to do with the people selling it, not the people who want to enjoy it. Let me take a question from the back of the room, this one right there. I'm gonna get one more after this. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Ash Verma from the Bay Area program. I'm uh, graduating this year. So Professor Smiley mentioned some of us uh, thinking in the direction of starting some ventures. What would be your uh, recommendations about uh, mentoring or coaching resources that might be available to some of us to develop the concepts into some viable ventures? Could you speak a little louder, please? I'm sorry. So uh, my question is, um, what are some of the 
mentoring or coaching resources which might be available to uh, to the people who want to start some new ventures in uh, the wine industry in the wine industry yes. okay uh, by resources right. where does he find a mentor the mentor um, I would say the best uh, thing there would be to call the Napa Valley Vintners it's a trade association of 390 wineries in Napa Valley or the Sonoma Wine Growers Association that has about 220, explain to them what you're looking for as a mentor, um, kind of the area of focus, because both of those groups have a very good staff, they know their members, and they could give you direction to two or three people that probably could, uh, if not be the answer, at least direct you better to the answer. Uh, but uh, the Wine Institute of California, for the more broad section, is also, and I would recommend s step one, those trade associations, unless you know people, or here at the university, there are people who can say, why don't you go talk to so-and-so. Uh, personal recommendations are always the best. Um, I don't think shooting an email to 30 wineries would give you much satisfaction. Let me take one more question from the back of the room, if I could. Right here. Put your, keep your hand up. All right, she lost you. Uh, starting a new venture, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, the ability for one person to have such a swing on the industry in the critic side of things, and how important you think it is to get your wines out to those critics when you're first starting out? Because it scares the hell out of us, because we don't want an 80, but at the same time, a 95 plus can really do something for your business. Well, let me, I think the critics are important. Uh, there are people who have genuflected to the critics and made the wine in the style that they believe the critic will give them high ratings. And I think that they are destroying their values and their soul by doing that. I think one of the beauties of wine is make the wine that is pleasing to you and gets you and your family and friends excited. And I think there are enough people in the world who will agree with you to where you'll be successful. And you don't have to be Parker or Lobby or get these 98 points because I can't drink those damn wines. They're too alcoholic. They don't invite you back into the glass. And I just don't <laughs> like them. Uh, so I would suggest follow your passion for the style of wine you like and then go to the restaurants or the wine shops and taste with them and develop, don't shotgun it, develop five good restaurants, two or three retail shops in Sacramento or San Francisco or LA or San Diego and then let them be successful with it and go. For example, I have a wine called M by Michael Mandavi. 700 cases, the first two years I made it wasn't good enough. In 03 and 04, I didn't like it, I blended it in with other wines. 05 was just released two months ago, it's $200 a bottle. I would not let Jim Lobby or Robert Parker taste it. They wanted to send me a sample, we want to rate it. I said, no, you can't have it. The only way you can have it is to either for me to go to you or you come to me. We're going to have lunch. We're going to taste that wine with a nice luncheon. I don't want you to line it up with all these wines that taste like port and then rate it because it won't rate high. And so trust yourself, particularly if you're going to be a, a, a winemaker or an entrepreneur or working with one, trust the winemaker, produce the style that you, your family, your friends really like, get feedback mainly from restaurateurs particularly chefs, because they know what tastes good. And if your wine uh, on the, the family table or in the restaurant, if the glass keeps getting empty, trust it. I think we're going to have to um, uh, call it uh, an evening. This has been absolutely de delightful. Thank you, Bob and Michael, for giving this very special, special evening.